Cover-up initiatives. Control of psychological sciences. In the previous chapter we saw examples of how multiple seemingly legitimate organizations within a country can function in unison to destroy an individual under the guise of providing medical treatment, and how the top medical minds are complicit in providing cover for the system. Whenever a society falls under the rule of psychopaths, the social sciences, particularly the behavioral sciences such as psychiatry and psychology, are tightly controlled. If such a system allowed these sciences to flourish in a normal way, then within about a decade the leaders in these areas of study would diagnose the state of affairs and begin to develop methods to counter it. Therefore, an exceptionally malicious international system of control is set up. Genuine scientific work which might expose the system is monitored. Specialists in these areas are intimidated and restrained. They are the targets of well-organized harassment campaigns and may be killed without a trace. The entire operation is done so as to not cause suspicion in countries governed primarily by normal people. We've seen in previous chapters that such a system of control over the psychological sciences has been established. Drug corporations write the CPGs, continually expand the definitions of mental illnesses, and create new ones. They influence the education that most physicians will receive by funding the medical schools and universities, and hiring consultants to write psychiatric textbooks. Wall Street also influences or controls professional societies, patient advocacy groups, and federal entities such as the APA, AMA, MHA, CHAD, NAMI, the United States Congress, FDA, and NIH. Their control extends down to insurance providers, medical centers, and in many cases individual doctors. Using their well-paid thought leaders, they are targeting the entire population for prescription medication use. These leading psychiatrists conduct the research, write the reports that appear in the world's top medical journals, and educate their peers at a variety of conferences to promote psychiatric drugs to treat fictional illnesses. Despite their implied moral superiority, the awards and titles that they hold which are society values, and their guise of professionalism, the actual behavior demonstrated by these industry leaders suggests that they are tremendously corrupted. When the pathological factor is considered, their almost unbelievable greed begins to make sense. In a society run by psychopaths, every single mental health center and psychiatric hospital, as well as the attitudes of all individuals working in these areas, are affected by the pathocracy. Hidden battles occur in these institutions between those who have decided to serve the system and others who are being harassed while trying to deliver beneficial information to the public. In any country that such a system exists there are those who are aware of its true identity and vigorously act against it. Usually, the more intelligent a person is the more difficulty they will have concealing themselves and accepting the pathocracy. Because psychopaths consider a normal person's ideas and actions abnormal, a government run by them will consider dissidents mentally ill. When a society is run from the top by psychopaths, the resources of the system are commonly used to drive perfectly healthy people insane. Scientifically and morally degenerate psychiatrists are used to accomplish this. In such a system mediocre and privileged people become psychiatrists who serve the pathocracy. Even mental health specialists with the best of intentions are working with knowledge that has been deliberately degraded in order to conceal the true nature of the system. What follows are examples of a cover-up. The industry's literature. Dr. Xavier Amador is a professor at Columbia University, Teachers College. He was previously on NAMI's board of directors, and was the director of psychology at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. His book, I Am Not Sick, I Don't Need Help, which was co-authored with Annalisa Johansson, includes a method developed by him to convince people to take their psychiatric drugs. The book is heavily promoted by NAMI. The Learn, Empathize, Agree, Partnership, Leap protocol outlined in this book is basically a method to trick people into medication compliance. The listening skills they suggest are based on the assumption that the person is delusional. The idea that a person could be telling the truth is not entertained. For instance, in the listen component, they describe, listen for beliefs about the self and the illness. Understanding how your loved one sees herself, and her beliefs about whether or not she is ill, is the key to unlocking her isolation and to building an alliance. You want to learn about what she thinks about taking psychiatric medicine. To build this alliance they suggest lying to the individual. In order to learn about someone's delusions, and their experience of being in a hospital and on medications, you sometimes had to let them have the mistaken impression that you believe in their delusions. In the empathize phase of the protocol, the appearance of empathy is used as a manipulative tactic to open the person up to suggestion, so that the ultimate goal of getting them to take their medication can be achieved. Dr. Amador's LEAP protocol, with fake empathy and the appearance of accommodation, 
is essentially a type of mind manipulation to deceive people into taking their medication. All of the steps lead to this single goal. No possibility that they're not sick or that they're telling the truth is observed. The book, The Complete Fa Family Guide to Schizophrenia, explains that when talking to a relative diagnosed with schizophrenia, you should avoid trying to convince them that their delusions are unreal. The logic behind this is that, despite presenting the individual with tremendous evidence against their delusions, their convictions will become stronger. They then mention that instead of focusing on the possibility that what they're saying is true, you should shift the conversation toward how they feel. This way you avoid strengthening their delusional beliefs. If your relative is willing to talk about these feelings the discussion can turn to strategies for dealing with them and the delusional beliefs associated with them. So, rather than focusing on evidence that supports their beliefs, which would allow the possibility that the beliefs are true to enter the conversation, the technique here is to focus on the feelings generated by the delusions, which of course can be addressed with medication. The book refers to this manipulative technique as empathetic listening. It appears to be variation of Dr. Amador's LEAP protocol, which it referenced. The website schizophrenia.com, run by independent researchers, including psychiatrists, advocates a slightly less manipulative technique, in its How to Manage Five Common Symptoms of Schizophrenia article. It suggests empathizing with the person so they think they're understood. By temporarily agreeing with certain aspects of the person's system of delusions, a partnership can be formed, they suggest. After fake empathy has been established, then, we're told, substituting more rational explanations for the sick person's highly personalized paranoid one, can be done. They tell us that only then can the sick person learn about all the benefits of medication. The Complete Family Guide to Schizophrenia suggests frequent daily reminders in order to get the person to comply with medication. Some include placing the pills next to items that the individual commonly uses, placing notes around the house, attaching the pills to personal hygiene items, etc. A common feature of the disorder, says the guide, is the sick person's inability to understand that they're ill. This lack of insight often results in a refusal to take medication. It's not your relative's fault, they say, it is part of the sickness. We're then told that that if you don't force your relative to take the medication, the inevitable consequences will be aggressive, violent, or bizarre behavior. Their solution is to have the person involuntarily committed. A book by Dr. E. Fuller Torrey, Surviving Schizophrenia, a manual for families, patients, and providers, refers to the act of having someone forcefully medicated as assisted treatment, and says that it may be necessary due to a person's lack of awareness that they're ill. However, this is usually not necessary according to Dr. Tory, because the mere threat of it will make most people compliant. Dr. Tory is a former consultant to NAMI and the NIMH. The Schizophrenia Handbook, put out by Bristol Myers Squibb Company, tells us that when people do not comply with treatment because they don't believe they're ill, friends and family must act to ensure that medication is taken according to the doctor's instructions. Talk therapy has limited value for those who are out of touch with reality, according to the Canadian Mental Health Association, CMHA. It is particularly ineffective for those exhibiting hallucinations or delusions. Medication, they tell us, is the primary treatment for these individuals. In its August 2008 article, Understanding Schizophrenia and Recovery, NAMI explains that a person's refusal to take medication because they don't think they're sick is a thought deficit, which presents challenges for people working with the sick person, getting them to take medication. Similarly, Schizophrenia.com tells us that the reason people are unable to understand that they're sick is because the part of the brain that is damaged by schizophrenia is responsible for self-analysis. You are frequently asking the sick brain to diagnose itself, they suggest. Because of this, involuntary treatment is an option. If the patient refuses, Dr. Amador and Mrs. Johansson advise that doctors acting under benevolent paternal ethic can force them against their will to be medicated. Like a parent who knows best for her child, we're comfortingly assured, the physician can take control. Dr. Amador and Mrs. Johansson, likewise agree that the person's inability to understand that they're ill is part of the brain disorder which does not improve with medication. A normal person's natural revulsion to these toxins seems to be part of the sickness. Sooner or later, they explain, when they recognize that what you did was out of love, they will likely be grateful. As Dr. Lobazowski informs us, when a society is run by psychopaths the resources of the system are commonly used to drive perfectly healthy people insane. An examination of the industry's publications reveals stories that include people being placed under 24-7 surveillance, harassed by their neighbors, stalked, mobbed, and losing their jobs. This culminates in a psychotic break, nervous breakdown, 
where their relatives usually have them committed and attack their credibility during hospitalization. These publications contain accounts of people initially refusing to believe that they were sick, then being placed in a hospital, medicated, and finally seeing the light. While hospitalized, their beliefs are destroyed. Their wills are crushed. After they're cured, they're released and treated like children by their relatives who constantly hound them to take their medication, i.e. remind them of how sick they are. One important part of the healing process is to get such delusional individuals to accept that they have a devastating brain disease, and that their delusions of being placed under surveillance, stalked, and hit with directed energy weapons, are completely false. The statements below illustrate this. When you first get out of the hospital you are going to be a little child again. There are new rules. Your parents are very worried about you. They will ask you twice a day if you are going to take your medicine. But in time I gave in, cooperated, and took my medication. Once I cooperated with the rules, took my medication, and followed their routine, I was permitted more and more privileges. They worry about me. My mother is always telling me to take my medication. I learned a lot about my illness, and I started taking my medicine regularly. I got better. The most important thing I did to get myself healing was to take the medication. After a couple of months I stopped taking my medication, and I got sick again. I started to think people were following me. Up until I got treatment, I thought there were a hundred people watching me 24-7. Despite claims to the contrary, convincing people that they have a brain disease is not about healing, but a clever maneuver to get a healthy, skeptical mind to identify itself with a sickness. More accurately, it is a method of taking a healthy mind and making it sick. This identification results in a surrendering of free will, which is usually accompanied by feelings of guilt and worthlessness. It is a method of mentally crippling someone. The treatment they receive is a type of punishment. The medication that they're forced to take, in addition to literally destroying their brains, is itself an emotional attack to beat them into submission. Statements below made by people diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia reveal this. They kept reminding me of my illness which did not help me when I was discharged from the hospital. I would have preferred my family not to even mention the illness to me. You hope that things will get better, but having to take the pills confirms, yes, you have a mental illness. This can be difficult. Taking the pills is a reminder every day that yes, I am a sick person. It's not easy to remember to take the medication. It can make you feel like a patient. Ashamed. But the effects, can keep you out of the hospital. Taking medication reminds me I am ill. Sometimes it bothers me because I don't feel like I am really sick. I hate the feeling that pills give me. Medication makes me tired, sleepy. Makes me feel I don't want to do anything. When I take medication I feel like I am on a leash. All of a sudden they tell me I have an illness called schizophrenia. It made me feel ashamed of myself, like I couldn't do anything right like a normal person. There are several definitions of the term delusion. The book, Me, Myself, and Them, a first-hand account of one young person's experience with schizophrenia, by Kurt Snyder, describes them as, false personal beliefs that have no basis in reality and remain unchanged even when the person is presented with strong evidence to the contrary. The most common type is the persecutory, where people think they're being spied on, stalked, and harassed. In his book, Mr. Snyder claims that prior to taking his medication he had delusions that the FBI and CIA were after him and that he was being stalked by hundreds of people wherever he went. To write his book, Mr. Snyder had the assistance of Dr. Raquel Eager, a psychiatrist at the Neurology and Radiology Department, University of Pennsylvania. His book is enthusiastically promoted by NAMI. The Nature of Delusion, The Complete Family Guide to Schizophrenia tells us, is that people cling to them in spite of overwhelming evidence against them. Thoughts that people are stalking you or trying to harm you are unfounded and paranoid, reports Bristol Myers Squibb Company. Such a mechanism does not exist according to their schizophrenia handbook. But they tell us that medication can help to relieve these delusional symptoms. Similarly, the Canadian Mental Health Association, CMHA, portrays the idea that a group people would conspire to harass an individual as false and irrational. Medication will help such delusions, they assure us. The site schizophrenia.com, likewise informs us that those who think that there is a government plot to harass them in public are suffering from a misinterpretation of events. Point one, they advise us, that rather than trying to reason with the individual regarding the plausibility of such delusions, talk to their doctor to arrange for an increase in their medication. Some schizophrenics have described an oversensitivity to noises such as people coughing, car horns, 
screeching tires, engines, machinery, etc., which they claim are intended to disrupt them. They even have delusions that aircraft are being used to harass them. When such delusional people experience explosions of noise from their neighbors, they see it as a deliberate attempt to disrupt them. But entertaining the possibility that the noises may be deliberate attacks is not advised by the researchers at schizophrenia.com. The beliefs, they tell us, are held only by the person himself and by no one else. Books such as The Complete Family Guide to Schizophrenia, Schizophrenia Revealed, Diagnosis, Schizophrenia, and others, contain stories of people whose delusional systems include thinking that they've been placed under 24-7 surveillance, stalked, attacked with directed energy weapons, and that their neighbors and family have been recruited by a federal agency to spy on them and drive them insane. Many have delusions that government agencies are monitoring them, controlling their movements, and projecting emotions and auditory hallucinations into their heads. The base for these electronic attacks is often their neighbors' homes, which are allegedly used by the FBI and CIA. Often it is the FBI or the CIA that is the suspected perpetrator of the scheme, proclaimed Dr. Tory. Absolute nonsense, we're assured. Looking back, mentioned a man diagnosed with manic depression, the strangest part was not the omnipresent government agents, or the agonizing radiation weapons. What frightens me most is that my manic depression gave me an immovable certainty that it was the world around me that was convulsing. Below are more examples of delusional beliefs suffered by people who have been treated with medication. I thought the CIA was trying to use some kind of psychological warfare techniques on me. It's hard for me to believe now, but I really thought the FBI was after me. It took me over a year to admit to myself that I wasn't being followed by people working at the facility, or the CIA, or the FBI. Those delusions just seemed more plausible to me. I felt as if there were a plot of, evil out to get me. I felt like the government might have been in on it. I thought there were helicopters flying over my house. I started to think I was under surveillance 24 hours a day by some unseen group of people. I thought people were after me, people wanted to kill me. I started to believe that there were many agents following me, perhaps 50 or 100 of them. I thought, why would there be so many people following me? I was trying to rationalize why there would be hundreds of agents following me. I couldn't. I felt like people were looking at me strangely and saying things about me. I believed that I was being followed by the FBI. My phones were being tapped, video cameras were set up in my house, and I couldn't even trust my friends or my family. I thought my house was bugged. I thought those people knew what I was wearing and what I was doing. I thought they put a camera in my house. I thought there was this FBI agent, one of the neighbors. I thought that my neighbors were watching me. I was having some problems with my next door neighbors. They were making accusations, fighting with my father, and taking parts off my car. I was going through some problems with the people in my neighborhood. I thought some people didn't like me. Most suffer from delusions of reference, thinking that objects or events in their immediate environment have been arranged to send them messages which are usually negative or threatening, sometimes satanic. They believe these messages are symbolically conveyed with objects, letters, and numbers, as well as staged discussions that occur in public by groups of people, and during telephone conversations which contain information about their personal lives. TV, radio, and print media may also be used to convey these messages. According to Dr. Tory, the Internet has been associated with an increasing number of delusions by schizophrenics in recent years, who believe that the CIA or the FBI is the culprit. Some reported PC and Internet delusions include frequent crashes, cursors moving on their own, the appearance of letters in documents, and frequent broken Internet links. While he was having his delusional experience, Mr. Snyder was convinced that the FBI had established remote control of his PC, but later concluded that he had a virus. Other common delusions experienced by schizophrenics include thinking that their minds can be read, that they're important, or capable of extraordinary things that their friends, family, and hospital staff are poisoning or drugging their food. Point two, obsessive religious beliefs can be symptoms of a delusional system also, according to Bristol Myers Squibb Company. Auditory hallucinations are quite common among diagnosed schizophrenics. They typically include clicking noises, as well as voices that provide a running commentary on activities, carry on conversations with the individual, issue them orders, warn them of impending dangers, and relentlessly mock them. The hallucinations are usually consistent with the person's delusional beliefs. For instance, thinking that they are part of a government harassment campaign and are the result of some electronic transmission. We are advised by schizophrenia.com that considering the possibility that hallucinations can in fact be broadcasted is not valuable. 
Below are some descriptions of hallucinations from people diagnosed with schizophrenia spectrum disorders. I was consistently making wrong turns on my way to my house. I started to believe the CIA was somehow controlling my thoughts with subliminal and inaudible messages piped into my truck. I began to hear clicking noises. They weren't coming from the real world, but they didn't seem to be in my imagination either. The frequency and duration of the voices increased, and so did the volume. They started following me wherever I went. I was hearing voices saying they were going to kill my father, rape me, kill me. I was hearing voices, cursing me out, saying they were coming to kill me. They were so audible. I saw men on the wall. With guns pointing in my direction. I was hearing voices. There were like voices coming from the vent in my room. The delusions continue inside mental hospitals, where some schizophrenics have arrived at the following false conclusions, that the mental hospital was really a detention center for the government, that doctors, staff and patients were harassing them, that various media including songs, print, photos, as well as overheard conversations are used to convey hostile messages, that hospital staff were poisoning their food. One girl, who has since been convinced that she is indeed suffering from a mental disorder, describes her personal experience inside a mental hospital. It should be pointed out that she believes she is sick and has attributed her interpretation of the events that occurred to be the result of delusions. The hallway outside her room was used for what she described as a fake scene of actors who were deliberately placed there to torment her. The actors included some patients, social workers, doctors, and staff who would frequently talk about her and participate in other charades. One patient had a tape player which repeatedly played the song Zombie by the Cranberries. The hallway also contained a glass cabinet with Polaroid pictures that included the faces of people that she knew. She described the entire scene as a prop, a fraud, and a charade used to torment her. There was a phone just outside her room which was often used by doctors and staff to blurt out information regarding her personal life. She felt as though the treatment was really an attack on her individuality, and referred to her room as a foxhole, which she remained in most of the time to avoid these painful experiences. However, the doctors, staff, and patients who were participating wanted her out of the room so they could torment her. When she didn't leave, they would enter her room to check her vitals, which she concluded was used as an excuse to attack her. She referred to her entire stay as a nightmare. In all likelihood, some of these mental hospitals are run by the security forces. This is similar to what is happening in Russia, China, and other countries. The difference is that the physical attacks have been replaced with PSYOP which leaves no visible marks. It appears that the financial elite have learned from their experience with the system that they built in communist Russia and made some adjustments. The latest disorder. Psychiatric experts have identified a new form of delusional thinking known as Truman Show delusion, also called Truman Show syndrome. Those affected by the disorder believe that they are being monitored and broadcasted to others in the population. The idea for the disorder originates from the 1998 film, The Truman Show, where the main character, Truman Burbank, begins to realize that he is being filmed everywhere he goes by tiny cameras, and that his friends and family are following a script in a type of deranged reality TV show for the entertainment of others. The illness was first discovered in 2002 by psychiatrists Ian and Joel Gold. In 2002 Dr. Joel Gold, a psychiatrist at Bellevue Hospital Center in New York, began noticing that some of his patients believed they were being unwillingly filmed for a reality TV program. Several of his patients even mentioned the film, The Truman Show. He and his brother Dr. Ian Gold, a psychiatrist at McGill University in Montreal, began presenting their findings at medical schools in 2006. Truman Show delusion is a combination of paranoia and delusions of grandiosity and reference. This basically means that people believe that their environments are being prepared to symbolically communicate with them. Although for years mental health specialists have encountered people suffering from delusions that their friends and relatives were complicit in persecution, this is different because it involves society in general. The new delusion encompasses a patient's entire life, where they think that surveillance equipment has been hidden in their homes and that they are under constant, intense surveillance by an army of people wherever they go, including workplaces and hospitals. Those suffering from the delusion think that these environments, which have been rigged with covered surveillance equipment, have been prepared specifically for them. They describe the people in these settings as actors following scripts. These actors include their friends, relatives, co-workers, and doctors. Since presenting their findings to medical conventions in 2006, the Gold Brothers have received international publicity. Beginning in 2008 the illness started to receive lots of attention. Psychiatrists in the United States and Britain are reporting that a growing number of their patients are suffering from this delusion. 
the new illness is considered a culture-bound delusion. The New York Times reported that because the DSM-4 has an exemption which says that a belief is not delusional if it is widely accepted by other members of a person's culture or subculture, that mental health specialists have suggested that it is too vague. Or, in other words the exception needs to be reduced. More specifically, it means that the scope of people who meet the criteria needs to be widened. WebMD informs us that although the Truman Show delusion may not be incorporated into the APA's DSM anytime soon, the reports of these psychiatrists must be considered by mental health professionals. Dr. Joel Gold announced, this is a serious mental illness. If you think the entire world is fraudulent, that is incredibly distressing. The Gold brothers are working on a scholarly paper for the new illness. It has been declared, as illustrated in the Surveillance Technology and Methods chapter of Volume 2, that the surveillance of interagency targets will be aggressive and constant. Multiple government think tanks have announced that targeted individuals will frequently be made aware that they're under surveillance so that their behavior can be changed. We also understand at this point that in order for the interagency to modify the behavior of the target, their environment must also be changed, and that this is done by psychologically preparing the target's environment with as many products as possible. As we learned in the schizophrenia chapter, Referential delusions are false beliefs that people, media, and objects in a person's environment have been staged in order to convey symbolic messages that are often threatening. We're told that some environmental stimuli which people falsely believe are being used to transmit these messages are newspapers, books, song lyrics, TV, and radio broadcasts. As described in the Psychological Operations chapter of Volume 3, products which the military has used to establish communication with its targets include newspapers, magazines, leaflets, posters, pamphlets, and books, as well as music, radio broadcasts, and telephone conversations. There have been multiple proclamations that targets of the interagency will have their radio and TV signals spoofed. It has even been revealed that digital morphing will be used. It has been stated that all conduits through which information reaches the TA will be interfered with. This includes every system, organization, and individual. We also learned that the interagency recruits agents of action, actors, who follow a script when communicating themes to a TA during a type of live performance known as a sci act. Furthermore, references in military documentation suggest that the process of theme presentation during these performances is consistent with play or movie production. This is particularly evident by the use of words such as, theater, actors, performance, script, sets, cast, audience, etc. These delusions of reference appear to parallel the military's PSYOP attacks against its targets almost perfectly. It seems that schizophrenia in general, and the latest mental illness in particular, are attempts by the establishment to conceal their use of the military to attack their enemies. It is probably also used to provide the psychopaths in the security forces, and the influential people in our society who they serve, with a type of sick entertainment. When someone says that they believe they are being surveilled for the entertainment of others, they may be dismissed as delusional due to false beliefs within the common worldview. These beliefs may take the form of statements such as, people would never do that. That would be sick and immature, and therefore unlikely. People aren't that deranged. They'd never be able to cover it up. That type of technology slash weaponry doesn't exist. It would be a waste of resources. We now understand that the technology to control and attack people remotely does exist. We know that these people do exist. Here's what we've learned about them, they frequently partake in activities that normal people would consider wasteful, foolish, and immature. Point 3 They require considerable excitement and entertainment to keep from becoming bored. They like to attack people and play games with them because it gives them a thrill. They feel sadistic pleasure mocking and controlling people, who they see as objects. They are also fully aware that most people in our society cannot conceive that they would ever do these things. Add to this, their ownership of the mass media outlets, control of professional societies, patient advocacy groups, and an army of experts, all of which they can use at any time to discredit those who expose them. They have covered this up just as they have all of their other crimes against humanity. Attempts to discredit efforts to expose them. Over the last several years clinicians have been increasingly receiving information from their patients which confirm their claims of being gang stalked and hit with directed energy weapons, as reported in the Journal of Mental Health, the New York Times, and Psychology Today. In 2007, 2008, and 2009, respectively. In the past, people who complained of such attacks to their family, police, or doctors were usually medicated. However, some have recently discovered the existence of an online community of people who share their experiences. 
It consists of a growing number of sites which have stories of people being attacked with directed energy weapons installed by large gangs of people who presumably work for the government. The Times mentioned that although patient advocacy group sites are considered to be helpful, other sites which reinforce delusional beliefs are impeding treatment, medication. This support community has grown to the point that it is interfering with traditional treatment due to the DSM's exclusion clause which prevents people from being diagnosed with schizophrenia if they are a member of a culture or subculture which shares the belief. Therefore, such sites have drawn the attention of mental health professionals recently who have raised concerns over their content, which they say have little quality control because they are not run by experts. Dr. Von Bell, a visiting research fellow in the Department of Psychological Medicine and Psychiatry at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College London, an editorial board member of Plus One and The Psychologist, began researching mind control sites in 2004. He evaluated the content of 10 websites that covered this subject some of which included accounts of people being attacked with directed energy weapons. Several independent psychiatrists were used to determine if the content was written by delusional people, and whether or not there was evidence of the development of a social organization, culture-slash-community, which would meet the DSM's exclusion clause. Dr. Bell and his colleagues reported the results of their study in the February 2006 edition of Psychopathology, where they stated that the information on most of these sites was written by people suffering from delusions. They also announced that there was evidence of a community of targeted people. Some sites contained scientific material to back up their claims, and were involved in efforts to lobby their elected officials to stop the use of this technology on citizens. He described this organization as a disabled group that has used the Internet to create a dynamic community to support similarly affected people within the confines of a limited worldview, which is based on delusional thinking. He said that it is an example of a culture that is independent of the support, control, of the state. It is also beyond the influence of what he explained as user groups, presumably referring to patient advocacy groups. He elaborated, in particular it demonstrates that the Internet may enable complex support mechanisms without reference to a view of reality held by the authorities. The members of this community insist that they are subjects of thought control weapons. They continually gather evidence which supports their beliefs. These sites have postings of people who are convinced that mental health professionals are providing cover for the gang stalking and directed energy attacks against citizens. In July of 2009, Psychology Today informed us that this online community exhibits a dangerous form of groupthink which is preventing patients from receiving the treatment, medication, that they need. The fact that people can form a community based on these irrational beliefs will present future challenges for the DSM diagnostic criteria, according to Dr. Bell who suggests that it should be revised to accommodate this new trend. If this trend continues most clinicians are going to remain ignorant which will produce more problems in the consulting room. So for now, he says that clinicians should be aware of the magnitude of information available on the Internet which can justify almost any conspiracy theory. An earlier report released by Dr. Bell and his colleagues in May of 2005, describes a type of theme where the affected person believes that the Internet is used as a medium to display information about them by a conspiratorial group. He also mentioned that because technology is available which could rationalize some Internet delusions, clinicians should instead focus on more unlikely signs of the conspiracy theory, such as the belief that a sinister organization exists which is persecuting people. What has obviously happened is this, the financial elite have become aware that entities have formed which are beyond the control of their professional societies and patient advocacy groups, and which are beginning to interfere with their profit and power. If their past behavior is any indication of what they'll do, we can expect the following. Massive international awareness raising campaigns regarding Truman Show delusion, Internet delusion, and delusional communities. Proclamations by professional societies denouncing these communities. Attacks against those exposing this by patient advocacy groups. The creation of websites and books which educate people to avoid such sites because of their lack of professional research and delusional content. Publications appearing in the industry's best medical journals, educating doctors on these new conditions. Worldwide conferences and educational ventures conducted by thought leaders educating their peers on these new circumstances. Updates to CPGs to include Truman Show Disorder and Internet Delusions, as well as a revision of the exclusion clause which informs clinicians that a belief is not a delusion if it is shared by others in the person's culture. More articles from the establishment's media outlets that include the testimonials of multiple experts who portray people and organizations exposing this as delusional.